I decided to watch one horror movie every day of October and rank them worst to best. I woke up on October 1st and decided I wanted to spiral into insanity for an entire month. And with how much I adore Halloween, I decided to do that by watching one horror movie every day of the month. The catch being that it had to be a movie I hadn't seen. Now, let me tell you, this was one hell of a challenge, especially since I seem to have been banished to London. Bloody hell. No prep, no planning, just raw dogging it. I never thought about the potential psychological impact of watching one horror movie a day, but it's probably exactly what you'd expect. Night terrors and nightmares were my best friends this month, and I at least hope you guys get a kick out of it. 31 horror movies rated from 0 to 10. There were some rules though. I could only watch one movie of a franchise, so no Halloween 1, 2, and 3 for example. The movies are rated through 5 criteria points, which lead to the final scoring. Because we are ranking horror films, scariness is a ranked criteria, and even if the movie is well made, if it's not scary, it's losing points. Note that these are my opinions and that they are objective and definitive. Anything you may not agree with is entirely your fault and wrong, and I implore you to seek help. I don't make the rules, that's just the cold hard truth. Alas, we have 31 movies to rank. Grab some popcorn or tissues, make yourself comfortable, and settle down for the ride. This one is a big stinker of a film, and I realize that a lot of people will not agree with me on that. Freddy Five Bear the movie sucks so fucking hard. I'm willing to say that this is one of the worst things I've ever watched, and not even the company I was in or alcohol could fix this one. I have to admit, I enjoyed the first few games, and I used to watch Jacksepticeye play through this series. This is the greatest thing I have ever seen in my life! All of the memes and pop culture jokes made me excited to watch this one, but none of that was present in the film. I'm fine, my headphones are gone! I was at least hoping they'd make it good, but I feel like they chose not to. This movie is not really a movie, but rather a bunch of executive decisions with wildly different perspectives and views on what the movie should become. It doesn't capitalize on being scary at all, using the aesthetic intention and claustrophobia of the games to create a freakish mystery horror movie. It also doesn't capitalize on being funny or a family mystery movie, which it tries so hard to be at times. It feels aimless and broken, a Frankenstein's monster of the film clearly created to satisfy wildly different-minded investors and executives. It's pathetically bad, and I felt it drain the life out of me while watching. Worst of all was that I was patiently and excitedly waiting for the mentioning of the Bite of 87, and it never happened. Is that the Bite of 87? Nothing in this movie is good. It's so convoluted and lost in its own sauce to be anything even slightly artistic. It had potential, but aside from half-assed singular moments, nothing comes close to making this enjoyable. This was the most disappointing watch of the challenge, and not even MatPat could fix that. My whole world is turned upside down. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> The taking of Deborah Logan fucking sucks. I'm not even going to be nice about this one. This movie is dog shit. This fake documentary about the case study of Deborah Logan slowly succumbing to her dementia only to seemingly be plagued by evil spirits is really just another shitty found footage style horror film. I will go on the record and say I'm not a fan of found footage, lazy ass, I'm a film my own death horror movies. They're normally uninspired and boring. Even highly praised films like Creep, which is miles better than this, still just cannot hold up next to proper cinematography. I know this is a hot take, but aside from this, Deborah Logan is also just a snooze fest of a film, the most predictable garbage horror schlock out there. Yes, some of it is superficially scary, but it's so cookie cutter that I could predict every little scare in advance. The documentary style is also unconvincing and badly acted. But all hate aside, I love my guy Gavin, he's a real one. There's one scene at the end which finally decides to do something unique and creative, and that genuinely made me smile. But it cannot be that I had to watch 90 minutes of this for one solid 20 second scene. I know some of you fuckers will eat this shit up. This is the horror movie equivalent of I'm 14 and this is deep. <clears throat> Damn, I gotta compose myself before the rest of the list. In the words of Mia Winters, Stay away. Thank you. 
Is it surprising that Amityville Horror starring Ryan Reynolds is bad? No. Is it surprising that Ryan Reynolds isn't the worst part of this film? Yeah. Look, I don't hate Ryan Reynolds, but he's unfit to play a possessed creepy family man. Like, I know it's just an excuse to stare at his beautiful abs while he chops wood, but there is not an ounce of horror resonating from those sweaty pecs. The Amityville Horror Story is iconic, but let's be honest, kinda boring. It's just a house supposedly on a native burial ground. So all accounts, even though the story may be true, it doesn't translate well to film. So how about we add a bunch of extra horror cliches to make the teens piss their pants? It's still not better, but the flashy early 2000s editing is amusing. Seeing Ryan Reynolds slowly go insane and be slightly mean to his wife's kids is not scary. It's just really, really funny. The characters are boring and the plot is not enough for a 100 minute film. It makes me realize how bad Ryan Reynolds movies were in the early 2000s, but I'm glad to say this is not as bad as Green Lantern. If you're lucky, the horror might get a wee gasp out of you, or maybe just Ryan Reynolds' abs. Is it weird how much I talk about his abs? Anyway, maybe a fun watch when drunk, but other than that, give this one a skip. This is another unpopular opinion on this list, uh, although to be fair, I, I don't know if I've counted how many there are, but this is definitely one of the more unpopular ones. Movies like Smile are the reason I don't listen to people on the internet. You should though, because my opinions are good and objective. Smile was so incredibly hyped back when it was released, from TikTok trends to general praise from YouTube reviews. Uh, real quick, this is me just editing over the video again, finding a YouTube review of the movie, and I don't know what Charlie was smoking, fucking 80% for the it's crazy. That's insane, dude. This is the kind of movie people who haven't seen any other horror movie have seen. It's a predictable and unoriginal ripoff of many other good horror films, one of which is later on this list. Basically, the story revolves around a demon who smiles and commits suicide in front of people, and whoever watches it happens to get the demon passed on to them. It's as basic as it gets. There are aspects I really like here, like the idea of a therapist going insane and the irony of that, or the aesthetic of the smile demon itself, but how many horror movies need to consult generational trauma? It's fatigued and boring at this point. Other than that, it's just poorly acted and directed. I heard Smile 2 is better, but I don't trust anyone anymore. Wow, so much negativity so early on in the morning can't be good. So here's a video of a dog doing a little dance to relax you a bit. Dracula 1931. Look, I love the story of Dracula. However, in my head, he either has to look like a rodent or Joe Biden. So seeing a sexy, mustacheless Bella Lugosi as Dracula really threw me off. As I've seen the story told a Dracillion times, it was nice that this movie got straight to the fucking point at the start. No soppy letters, no build up to the vampire. In the first few minutes, Renfield is chugging to Transaland and being shot with exposition. But then they just straight up show Dracula in his kinky little crypt. So mystery is also kind of out of the window. That's kind of upsetting as it just means the movie turns into a waiting game for them to slowly and stumbly trudge through the plot. Which, by the way, has changed a lot. For example, Dracula has hypnosis powers and Parker is replaced by Renfield altogether at some points. However, the changes are done in such a way that the story actually stays the exact same, which seems pointless. All it really does is create a superficial spin on it. I was just waiting while these men all chatted in a room for an hour, hoping they would finally figure it out so the movie could move on. They clearly threw lots of money at this, and this is a natural evolution after Nosferatu with a new Hollywood budget and an American vision. It's the yassification of Dracula, which just loses that freaky critter pizzazz of the German expressionist version. Those bats made me cackle more than once, and honestly, that's a good thing. This movie was weird as hell, but I wouldn't go as far as to call it bad. For the time it came out, it's honestly such a unique and fun horror movie. The concept is absolutely ludicrous, and the execution is fever dream-esque. The best part is, it features Snoop Dogg as a haunted corpse as he takes revenge on the men that wronged him. This is a classic haunted slasher disguised as... I don't even know what it's disguised as, but it is so unhinged. There's some extremely freaky imagery here and unique horror concepts. I wouldn't really say they work very well, but the fact 
fact that this movie tried it is such a win in my eyes. So in half of this movie, there's a dog with Snoop Dogg's soul manifested in it, of course. It's so hard to describe this film or even really critique it. I, I guess I could say the story and characters are all over the place and the pacing is dog shit, excuse the pun. But the general presentation and atmosphere is kind of still unique. It's Snoop Dogg as a ghost. It's a put on when you're drunk or high film and make fun of it, which is probably exactly what Snoop Dogg would have wanted out of this. Don't expect anything groundbreaking in terms of directing or acting, but I think if you go into this with an open mind, it, it could still be pretty fun. Fright Night is one of the campiest movies I saw this month. It's also one of the most mediocre. Vampire stories can be great, and though this has some fun contemporary elements, I personally think they fall flat for the most part. A teen discovers his new neighbor as a vampire and tries to stop him for some reason. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, the motivation is pretty weird. If my neighbor was a vampire and no one believed me, I'd keep my fucking mouth shut and lie low. I doubt vampires kill their neighbors, so the motivations made this so frustrating. The vampire himself is cool and some side characters are comical and fun, but the pacing and general blocking of the scenes is awful. Some scenes are so incredibly static it feels like a high school theater play with tape lines on the floor. There's no flow to the editing and the acting can be extremely stiff. The best part by a landslide are the practical effects. They are amazing. Good enough to watch the movie for? I don't really know. The Hills Have Eyes is not a movie I'd originally had on the list, but my attention was brought to it by my roommate who said the concept was quite freaky. He's right, it is pretty frightening. A story about a family going off the beaten path in the desolate desert and running into a family of inbred cannibals who want to eat them and their baby is pretty diabolical. I had heard the remake of this is quite graphic and sadistic, however, when I realized the original was directed by Wes Craven, I couldn't do him the disservice of not watching his version. Well, anyway, this isn't very good. I can see a lot of Craven's genius in this, but as one of his earlier hits, it's obvious how much he built on the foundation of this for films like Elm Street and Scream. This movie is serious, but sometimes, if not quite on purpose, does fall into campy nature, which later clearly developed into Wes Craven's signature style. But here it's all hampered by how sluggish it feels. There is some fun stuff here, like the use of the two dogs as a plot mechanic, and also the slow revealing of the cannibals. However, the characters are all pretty unlikable, and the spectacles are few and far between, making this really quite boring to watch. It's definitely got its merits, its setting and uncanniness being its strong suits, but it's far from being anything I'd call good. Serviceable and mindless, which is something horror is allowed to be. I don't even know if I can review Savage Land because I did fall asleep watching it, but I think that speaks plenty to my ranking of it. This movie is not bad. It's a mockumentary about strange happenings out in rural Arizona and the potential supernatural aspect to a murder spree. The mockumentary style is very well done and it seems like a real documentary Netflix might put out, but that's my main flaw with it. Just like a Netflix documentary, it feels overinflated and redundant. Again, I can see how many people would enjoy this given the popularity of Netflix documentaries, but this is just another movie I find hellishly boring. I'm not really into true crime, so it never caught me, and I don't really think it does much well aside from emulating a documentary very accurately. I can't fault the filmmakers because the film is well made, too bad the medium it's copying is so dull. To conclude, Savage Land is not very savage. It's real, I guess. I think somebody poop. It's always hard to say if a bad horror movie is not worth watching, however at this point even if I rate a movie badly, everything coming up is to some degree watchable. I think Wreck is a decent found footage film, however the only version I was able to watch was the English dub which heavily dampened my experience. 
I like the concept of the documentary. Following firefighters on an emergency call that turns into a quarantine in a building with a demonic presence is pretty great. However, the found footage aspect is the part that makes it annoying to me. Again, the plot reasoning is fine. They want to film for their safety and to make sure they capture all the wrongdoings, not suspecting supernatural shenanigans. But the camera direction is what makes this nauseating. So much shaking, such bad framing, and so many nonsensical scenes. Hardly decipherable through the shaky cam. Look, I'm gonna be completely completely honest and say this is quite creepy, but it's just not for me. In retrospect, I probably could have picked a better selection of films and not put as much found footage in given my hate for the genre, but it benefits you guys because you get to see me suffer through it. I'm going to keep this review pretty short. Sleepaway Camp is not at all what I expected it to be, yet exactly what I expected. It's so bad that it's simultaneously a masterpiece, and maybe that is the most frightening aspect of this film. This is a movie that is really worth watching blind. I'm convinced no one actually enjoys most of this, however it seems more like a social experiment than a proper film. What seems to be a normal summer camp slasher film is not in any way normal. There are really unsettling elements in this, from purposefully bad acting, to actually bad acting, to mediocre acting, to fake mustaches, to wonderfully gay costumes and James Earl Jones' dad. This is either the most woke slasher film of its time, or the most conservative film. You see how it's hard to explain? This movie shocked me to my core, and also bored me to death. Please go watch this and let me know what you guys think, because I am truly stumped. This movie may have ruined my life, and has given me irreversible brain damage. Thank you, why, you bastard. Here we go again, another found footage movie. I've added up to the fucking roof of found footage, but um, I cannot hate on this film for that. The Blair Witch Project is the found footage film, and the only movie to use it so immersively that it makes the horror movie more effective. This movie wouldn't work without the found footage, it barely does with it, but it manages to encapsulate that raw desperation of being lost in the woods. Don't quite know what that feels like, but I imagine that this is quite accurate. This movie has very little in sense of structure, which I think is the idea Idea. The documentary aspect at the start seems so real I could have been convinced it was. A perfect setup to an otherwise lukewarm horror film. This review is slightly conflicting. The film is uniquer. That's not a word. Oh, the film is unique and perfect in its uniqueness. It uses its tools masterfully, yet the story and characters aren't all that. I see lots of hate online about how annoying the characters are, and even though I agree, that to me isn't a flaw of the film. Rather, it elevates the desperation and frustration of the situation. It's clearly on purpose. This movie is a vibe, and it's the epitome of analog horror. It's nothing else though, just that. And I think that's good enough. I remember watching Final Destination 2 a year ago, and it was thoroughly funny and entertaining. The Rube Goldberg nature of the deaths was insanely fun and silly, so I'd assume that Final Destination 1 would be just as good. Even though critically it is regarded as better, I can't help but find the scope of it to be subpar compared to what I learned to love about the sequel. The story is probably better, but honestly, you're not watching these films for that. Watching the main characters who by accident survived a plane crash by not boarding it, realize that death is hunting them down and trying to kill them is a little tedious when you've seen the sequel and already know the gist. This is still a really fun film though, especially with friends. Predicting the deaths in advance and enjoying the theatric nature of them is the entire fun of this film. Also, there's a Tony Todd cameo in it, and I think he's basically playing death. And that makes me want Tony Todd to play death in every movie. I love that guy. It's an amazing concept for a horror film, and the 2000s aesthetic, sprinkles of homophobia, weird Hollywood names, and awful outfits make this a real staple of early 2000s horror movies. Thank you. 
Friday the 13th was another one of those classic slashers I hadn't seen. It's extremely interesting to me that this movie has almost nothing to do with the broader franchise everyone knows and references. There is no hockey mask wearing maniac and no real supernatural aspects. Jason is a concept in this film, but he's not a killer, which if I'm being honest, is fun. The idea that this movie has been elevated by the fact that as a modern viewer, I know about Jason Voorhees, the huge supernaturally strong machete wielding killer, and I hear about him in this and it makes me shudder is incredible. Incredible. It unintentionally plays into the less is more idea. This first movie starts out pretty strong but turns into quite a badly paced checklist of counselors slowly dying. The gore for its time is fantastic and shocked me. The iconic music sound effect is as unnerving as it would seem and there are some fun twists in this. It's not an incompetent thriller, it's just quite boring. It's missing the spark that a movie such as Halloween has. They pumped out one of these a year during the 80s and honestly it seems like a fun little Halloween ritual to sit down with friends and see how Jason can kill people in increasingly stupid and gory ways. This balances that beautiful mindless background horror that is so fun to watch with friends and I believe that this is why it's become as popular as it is. The Sixth Sense. This one was honestly quite fun to finally give a watch. To preface, I had known the twist, I knew what was coming, and with that perspective it was pretty obvious. Regardless, it was cool to analyze every scene to see how they hid the secret. It's some clever filmmaking and the kind of innovation I like seeing in the horror genre. I can follow Shyamalan for a lot of things, but this is definitely some great horror cinema. Some parts are a bit weird though. Willis kinda just meanders around the entire movie, he doesn't really do anything interesting and because of that, I really don't care much for him. Sora from Kingdom Hearts, however, is a different story. There was some genuinely great child acting and he could have honestly had even more scenes to shine. Especially his dynamic with his mum, played by Toni Collette. It was really compelling. All in all, a good watch. <laughs> I really want to like Possum more, but there's one large aspect that hinders me from doing so. Very simply put, there's not enough here to make a movie. The concept of the disgraced children's puppeteer going back to his hometown and abusive uncle while trying to free himself from his trauma and guilt is great, but it doesn't mean I enjoy watching Sean Harris walk around like Mr. Grumpy all the time. You can cut at least half of this movie out without changing its effect slightly. It's not even a long movie. I want to love this, and again, I enjoy a lot of what it has to offer. It's psychological psychology and messages and that weird dude from Bloodborne. <laughs> But is there enough to call this good? It's quite creepy though. Also, that's not a fucking possum. And we've made it to the halfway point. Restock those tissues or that popcorn and take a quick stretch because the movies coming up are no longer tricks, but certified treats. The Visit by M. Night Shyamalan is honestly quite alright. It's a found footage again, but this time I'm happy to say it's not to the movie's detriment. Most of the found footage reasoning is solid and the camera is placed more often than not, allowing for framing and stability. Plot-wise, it's a lot like Deborah Logan, but in my opinion better. The plot is about two kids meeting their grandparents for the first time, as their mother had been estranged to them from a young age. However, they act weird and run around at night. This freaks the kids out, but given their investigative nature and the fact that that they are making a sort of documentary, they indulge more than they should. I like this, it's nothing spectacular, but the plot was serviceable and the child actors were really good. They stole the show honestly, and their mom played by Katherine Han was also a great addition. Maybe I'm an idiot, but in retrospect, the super obvious plot twist got me and shook me to my core. It's still not my kind of horror film, but the fact it trumps Deborah Logan makes me very happy. <laughs> Now you might be wondering why I put the visit above Blair Witch even though I called that the epitome of found footage. It's uh, quite simple. I don't fucking like found footage. The visit is the least found footage out of the found footage and to me, god that's a lot of found footage, <laughs> and to me that makes the movie more watchable. Also this is my list and I can do whatever the hell I want. 
House of Wax may be a shitty early 2000s horror film, but I, and I'm not ashamed to say this, I like this a lot more than I expected to. Just to clarify, this is not a particularly well-crafted movie. Far from it, but it's got the right amount of jank and camp to make it both entertaining and endlessly unnerving. In this film, a group of college kids, I, I think, get lost in rural America, I don't know where, and end up in a town that is apparently prided for its wax figure exhibition. However, it is clear that the wax figures may not be all they seem. I know it's pretty obvious, but I'm trying to abstain from spoilers because this movie gave me some fun gasps. The concept for this film I find deeply disturbing and the execution is all there for the horror. Where the movie falls flat is the fact that it takes about one hour before they even end up at the place, the blurb talks about, and half of the characters have absolutely no reason to be in the story, like Paris Hilton who is only in this to strip tease? If you cut away a good third of this movie and half of its characters, it would be infinitely stronger, especially since the two main protagonists are clever and cunning. However, aside from that, I do find a certain charm in the junk food aesthetic it brings along with it. It's a really fun time and I do recommend this one. <laughs> Candyman is an unnerving movie. Now the one I watched was the original 1990s version. This is another one of those films that's pretty hard to describe without seeing it. It's essentially the boogeyman meets Bloody Mary. Huh, well I guess it wasn't that hard. Anyway, this film is more than just a horror film. It's a twisted love story and a social commentary all in one. It seems to me that those elements really heighten the unnerving and depressing nature of this film. For its time, it did something really unique compared to its slasher counterparts. Candyman is not only a scary villain, he also has noticeably more personality and gravity than other slasher killers. The story of this one is compelling due to this. You want to know what his motives are and why he does what he does. He is horrible yet also oddly charming. Tony Todd's soothing voice in tandem with his towering figure make him all the more creepy. To sum up the plot shortly, a reporter of sorts investigating urban folklore finds herself framed in a murder by Candyman and tries to uncover the truth about him. It's quite a unique premise and the presentation is depressing and dire. It's not without flaws, but all those aside, this film stuck with me and made me think, which I don't do very often. Just when I thought horror fatigue was hitting, this snapped me out of it again. <laughs> I should get up and do a little dance to this one. The Wicker Man was amazing to watch, not only because of Christopher Lee, well, well, mainly because of him, but also because it's an incredibly unique film. A policeman travels to a remote Scottish island town to investigate a missing persons case and gets caught up in the locals' bizarre pagan traditions. It's a spiritual precursor to Midsummer and hits all the same marks in a slightly more interesting way. Not to diss Midsummer, but this was clearly heavy inspiration for it, and I like a lot of what this does more. One aspect of this that is quite Quite different to Midsummer is that this is pretty much a musical, a haunting one at that, but there's a lot of music in this and a lot of it goes really hard. Midsummer is definitely the scarier film, but the characters and discovery of the pagan rituals is more convincing and beautiful in this film. This is hardly a horror movie for today's standards, but it's a lovely nostalgic view at something that would have been considered terrifying at the time of its release. This is a beautiful film, hauntingly so, and it's incredibly entertaining to watch. The Invisible Man. No, not the remake with Elizabeth Moss, which by the way is also fantastic, but the 1933 original with Claude Rains. I'm not gonna bore you TikTok brain viewers with this for long, but this movie is quite brilliant. The story is simple, a scientist goes invisible due to an experiment, and although originally developing a cure, goes mad with the potential power his new ability gives him. It's short and sweet, clocking in at 70 minutes. You have no excuse not to watch this. The invisibility effect is astounding for its time, and the acting is so fun and theatrical. They don't make movies like this anymore, which is totally understandable, but damn, this shit is so good. So good, in fact, that this is who I'm dressing up as for Halloween. <laughs> Uh, 
It's interesting rating old horror movies versus modern ones. I realized throughout this challenge that contemporary movies generally seem more scary because my brain defaults to that as being in the time I live in. However, it's not fair to discredit older films even if they don't seem as scary now. So it was a real challenge to open my mind to this and take in older films the same way I do new horror films. But it's 100% worth it because I'd wager modern horror movies have taken a serious dive in quality. For Carrie, I had seen the 2013 remake of it ages ago, and it fucking sucks. Julianne Moore is great in that remake, however the rest was just really, really dull. I'm glad to say the original does this a lot better. Based on a Stephen King book, and this time directed by Brian De Palma, it is full of terrifying imagery and power. Carrie, a telekinetic kid who is relentlessly bullied after having her first period and has to deal with an overbearing and maniacally religious mother, tries to love herself in a world that has decided to hate her. As her power grow and the bullying comes to a sadistic high, she finally lets her powers loose in a mad spectacle. It's pretty fun. This is one of those films that is 90% build up, so in that regard you'll be clenching your butt cheeks for the entire film. However, the film itself is extremely mild in terms of horror and thrill. Regardless, the great acting and character work makes this go by in a flash and honestly makes this a pretty fun high school drama. Well, with a fucked up ending. I audibly gasped when John Travolta showed up. I don't know why I mentioned that, but I thought I'd add that in to the review. Also, someone on Letterboxd called this a period piece, which is wild. <laughs> I was really excited to finally watch Ouija Origin of Evil, and yes, I'll be calling it Ouija, not Ouija, because both is okay, but one sounds like Mario's brother, and shit. The Ouija board? The Luigi board? Making a Luigi board? Have you played the Luigi board? Can you play a Luigi board? What is a Luigi board? I adore Flanagan's horror work, because it is always, first and foremost, a character study. In this case, it tries to tackle grief and loss using the Ouija board as the main narrative gimmick. This is definitely one of the more superficial one of his projects, the most by-the-books church versus evil kind of story, but that also means the scares are more superficial. I don't mean this in a bad way though, Flanagan's work often dives into psychological trauma and issues not everyone finds scary, so by that logic, this is more approachably scary. So basically, I'm saying more people will find this scary, even if not as deeply so. The characters are fun, and I wouldn't expect less from the Flaniverse cast. The real standout is that freaky fucking child who acts as the conduit for the ghosts. She is probably one of the best child actors I've ever seen, and she steals the show and turns this already creepy flick into something above average. You can never go wrong with Flanagan. He is a superb director and this movie is tense and effective. The fact that this isn't even close to his best work just shows how good his work in general is. This was a really decent horror film. <laughs> This was the first time I was questioning what exactly a horror movie really means as a term, because Green Room did not seem to evoke horror for the first 20 minutes or so. Don't get me wrong, the acting was great and the setup was cool, but it was not scary. But then it all changed. This movie spirals into chaos and brutality. I was wrong. It is unbridled horror, just of a slightly different caliber. It also features a better Patrick Stewart cameo than Multiverse of Madness. So to explain the plot a bit, a punk rock band accidentally performs at a venue full of Nazi skinheads, and while leaving witnesses something they weren't meant to, leading to the Nazis cornering them in a room and thinking of ways to kill them. This is panic-fueled. Not only the very real fear of Nazi skinheads, but also the situation of being cornered and having to lock oneself in a room with people waiting for you to come out or starve. The punk setting is really cool, and I understand that the themes are meant to portray willingness to change or be wrong, but the punk aspect does just stay a background element, as far as its aesthetics. The themes are clear, but I feel their punk rock aspect could have been more center stage. That aside, this is a very enjoyable horror film. I was shaking while watching this, as it was so incredibly anxiety inducing. Patrick Stewart plays a real evil motherfucker, which is so refreshing to see. It's always great having good hero actors play truly diabolical villains. This movie is not perfect, but it is of a high caliber with its gore, aesthetics, and tension. <laughs> Thank you.
It follows. This movie I watched about a week into the challenge and this was the first one to get under my skin. This is an outstandingly innovative film with some quite obvious flaws. The film is set in Detroit, which is the first scary thing about it. 28 samples. The premise is absurd. To sum it up, the main character, Jay, contracts an STD, but not the one you're thinking of. I'm talking about... Yeah, you heard me. When you're possessed by this demon, you can pass it on by having sex with someone else. So that's what happens to the main character, and the movie follows her trying to get rid of the demon. The demon is mostly half-naked or naked people hunting down and slowly following the victims until they catch them. It is so bizarre, but also so intensely disturbing. The movie manages to create one of the most unnerving yet bizarre atmospheres with a haunting synth soundtrack and beautiful cinematography. My main gripe was really that I couldn't care less about the main character. They just weren't very interesting. However, the horror made up for it and the nightmare-esque setting, lack of coherent logic made it all the more disturbing. This was a great modern horror film. The Thing is essentially a Play-Doh horror extravaganza. Isolated researchers in Antarctica come across a shape-shifting biological organism, or a thing to more accurately describe it, killing them and taking over their bodies and forms. Helmed by Kurt Russell's pragmatic and lusciously haired McCready, this movie is a whole lot of mistrust, flamethrowers, and things. God, this was a good time. John Carpenter really knows what the fuck he is doing when it comes to horror. I kid you not when I say that the practical effects are so unfathomably good that I couldn't help but believe it was real. I've never in my life seen effects as good as this. You watch The Thing and you're like, yep, th that's a thing, all right. This is a great, great film. The soundtrack by Ennio Morricone is also fantastic and chilling. See what I did here? Ch chill, uh, okay. I check everyone's hand who made this film. This is fantastic stuff. <laughs> The Witch is undoubtedly a fantastically made movie. Not as horror heavy as others on this list, a colony Puritan family learning to hate each other due to the presence of a witch tormenting them is beautifully acted and directed. Eggers is a masterful director and I enjoyed this more than I thought. It had very unsettling moments and it's extremely depressing, which I guess adds to the needed horror elements. I love that Ralph Ineson, the guy you know as every second NPC in The Witcher 3, shows his phenomenal acting chops here. This does feel like a Witcher three side quests, just maybe one that Geralt declined. Oh, that's rough. My sympathies. Leading to the demise of this family. I love the poetry in this, the fact that each sin of the characters plays into the way the witch torments them. It's so simple and effective. It's also mostly shrouded in mystery, which is never resolved. It gives you hints and as far as I know has a lot of historical basis, but a lot of the happenings in this film are not entirely shown or ever explained. This can often make movies incomplete, however the fact that this movie is so meticulously made and detailed, it's clear it's a stylistic choice, which ends up elevating the atmosphere and story storytelling. It's a fantastic film and I very highly recommend this one. I finally did it. I finally watched Halloween. I wanted to get some stuff out of the way here. This movie has atrocious acting in it, but honestly, I don't think that matters. If anything, it elevates the low budget origin of this film. It's where it all really started for slashers and I can verify it is a certified Halloween classic. John Halloween is a scary motherfucker. He's got that Mama, I, I flew up in my bed stance with his loud breathing and creepy movement. He is a formidable foe. Jamie Lee Curtis with long hair is honestly just as scary, but she's good in this movie aside from her making the dumbest decisions ever at the end of the film. This movie is a masterclass at directing horror, flawless buildup of tension, simple and striking music, and iconic characters. Here's my main flaw with it though. I think in a lot of ways the fact that this turned into a franchise really hurts the original
original. The tension built in this only really works when we don't know what happens to Jamie Lee Curtis's character. Franchises are the death of good horror, and this really was the start of that. Dumb character decisions and death fakeouts, while they work in this, have created a detrimental flaw with most horror writing after this. That's not a diss to this film, and rather to me who chose to watch so many bad horror movies that ripped this off before watching it. I watched this with my friends, and even though we didn't find it very scary, it put us all in the Halloween mood, which is the highest of praises, honestly. This film is outstanding for its time and is rightfully one of the kings of horror. <laughs> Trick or Treat was indeed quite a treat. If in future someone asks for the epitome of a Halloween movie, I would probably send them to watch this. Four interwoven stories set on the same Halloween night in a rural town, each with a unique premise and fun group of characters. It's gory, spooky, funny, but also just oozing with the Halloween aesthetic. The pseudo narrator or character we watched this movie from, Sam, is this kid with a pumpkin head and he's the coolest motherfucker ever. I understand that some of this movie is not scary, but rather just a vibe. Halloween has that campy nature to it, and this movie understands that so incredibly well. For Halloween in general, I feel like there's this sense of fabricated horror that, ooh, spooky, with wiggling fingers. I, I did just wiggle my fingers. I think what I love about this specifically, though, is how well it balances all these elements in its short 80-minute runtime. There are genuinely tense and hair-raising scenes in this, yet also fun and goofy ones. I watched this all the way on day 24, and it was such a breath of fresh air. It fully understood itself, and its premise and committed to it in the most charming way. Halloween horror movies don't always need to be edgy, and this is the proof of that. I can't rank this as the best horror movie, but maybe a small tiara-sized crown for the best Halloween movie on this list. Which, uh, just to clarify, doesn't mean that Halloween that I rank for this is not the best Halloween movie. This is the best Halloween Halloween movie, as in like thematically, right? It's not part of the Halloween franchise, and it's definitely not the best of that, because because uh, that would that that wouldn't make any sense. So I feel like they both deserve a tiara because they're both the best Halloween movies, but different Halloweens. But um, yeah, wh whatever. <laughs> Even though I may have lost my mind doing this challenge, I can tell you guys one thing with full certainty. These next two movies, the only 9 out of 10s on this list, are in the ballpark of being some of the best movies I have ever seen. They now hold a special place in my heart, and even though I may now be psychologically damaged, at least I have these two movies to love and cherish now as a result of this challenge. There are few words to describe how incredible the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is. As someone who knew nothing about the Slaughter family lore, everything about this was new to me, except, well, the fact that it's set in Texas and that there's a, a chainsaw massacre. Anyway, this movie is as beautifully made as it is horrifically disturbing. A group of friends visit a rural part of Texas to find an abandoned house from their childhoods. One by one, they stumble into the arms of the Savage Sawyer family. It's a short movie, and I really don't want to give too much away. The real genius genius in this movie lies in the presentation of Leatherface and his family, along with the beautifully structured two-part nature of the film. It's quite poetic in the way it reveals elements to us, which are then later reiterated to great effect. Often, in standard horror movies, there's an artificial sense of build-up, redundant and shallow conversations in order for the movie to reach its runtime. This movie has none of that. Each line of dialogue is necessary, and every character and scene has deeper and foreshadowed meaning. This movie is incredibly disturbing. Leatherface is as scary as he is unique as a slasher villain. His family and all their quirks and terrors manage to beautifully frame Leatherface and his horrific actions. I can't believe this film is from 74. It's so radically visceral, I understand how it got banned in some places. It's not even that it's particularly gory, but the implied gore is so intense that your mind just fills in the blanks. If your stomach is lined with lead, this movie is definitely for you. And if it's not, it probably is not for you. <laughs> Now, both these films are masterful, but only one of them can win and be number one. It's also incredibly funny that I watched this movie all the way back on day two of the challenge, but nonetheless, it could not be dethroned. Without further ado, 
Misery. Adapted from Stephen King's book of the same name, this movie blew my socks off. This is a panic-inducing thriller. Kathy Bates, who I hadn't seen in anything before this, absolutely nails the crazy bitch energy. Essentially, this is a cabin fever movie where an author who crashes his car in a blizzard gets nursed back to health by this secluded nurse who is an obsessive fan of his. She holds him hostage and keeps him immobile in order to rewrite the ending of her favorite book franchise. Her mood swings constantly and it's genuinely terrifying because as the viewer it is impossible to read her. Paul Sheldon, who tries to match her freak in order to stay alive, constantly has to navigate her intense and unpredictable mood swings as he tries to escape. It's brilliantly written and acted and because of its small cast and very real setting, it's just fucking terrifying. Stalking and mental health are really easy horror elements to use but also really easy horror elements to fuck up and I'm very impressed how it was implemented here. This is a masterpiece. I had so much fun watching this. The pacing is fantastic and the suspense is off the charts at times. It's a great horror film. <laughs> Wow, take a look at the time. You really watched through all of that, huh? I bet you'll watch anything. But in all seriousness, thank you for sticking through that list. I'm not exaggerating how exhausting and stressful it was to put this together in 30 days, but I can say for certain it was worth it. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it, and I will give you a tiara-sized crown as a reward. If you're not subscribed and you like this content, like and subscribe for my future 24-day Christmas challenge. That was a joke. I've seen strong soldiers break doing that. A 24-day Hallmark challenge does sound funny for sure, but I'd only attempted if this video gets 100 likes. <laughs> Good luck with that. Don't forget to rate the movies in this list you've seen in the comments. Have the spookiest of Halloweens. Konosodor Sam out.